Trauma medicine, it's something that certainly could save your life. Hi everybody, John McLaughlin. It is time again for another Warrior Wednesday and another McLaughlin joins us, Brian. And we, in all disclosure, there's no relation. So we sometimes get, get family members confused, but Brian is with Mountain Man Medical and Mountain Man are the folks that are making our trauma kits for Iowa Firearms Coalition that you folks have been ordering and we appreciate that. Uh, Brian, uh, first of all, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you went from kind of the military into uh, the private industry now and helping folks get squared away on a civilian basis. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. Uh, well, I got started with uh, trauma medicine when I was a kid, of course, went to Boy Scouts. My dad was a career uh, firefighter and an EMT. So, you know, I learned some of the basics from him, went on a few calls with him and got a chance to see uh, that whole thing in action. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of desire to be a firefighter, but I always wanted to join the military. So um, I, I joined that way. My dad was in, so that's why I, I wanted to go. So I had a, um, a good career. I spent some time in Afghanistan with the Marine Corps uh, doing some combat operations, saw a decent amount of combat there. Um, and then um, I was a uh, ER tech for quite a while and then uh, worked at a rig for a bit. And then when I got out, ran a uh, consulting company for uh, faith-based organizations teaching um, uh, catastrophic emergencies and active shooter medicine type of stuff. All right. Awesome. Um, I don't know if uh, you know offline, but just for the rest of the audience, my uh, youngest son's a ER trauma nurse. So uh, he and I have done several uh, like TCCC based classes and he, he calls me and laughs and says, dad, you know, you do all this moulage and the fake blood, you know, tonight I had this many knife wounds or some guy tried to, you know, shoot his face off with a shotgun. And uh. so we're, we're bringing you on because you have the, the true hands-on experience. And, and first of all, uh, as we go into May, uh, the Stop the Bleed flo uh, folks have uh, designated that Stop the Bleed month. So what would your admonition be based, based on your background and certainly uh, your affiliation with Mountain Man now on civilians getting training? I, it's, uh, I'm pretty biased. I, I get it. But I think it's very, very important. You know, one of the things that I think um, kind of sticks out the most is how, you know, good trauma medicine kind of trans transcends all politics and religion and all the things that get people all spun up and mad at each other. And you might not think it's... Um, responsible to allow civilians to carry firearms to protect themselves but everybody can agree that carrying a trauma kit is something that everybody needs to know how to use and, and learn how to use yeah so and i have carried a firearm for close to 20 years and i can tell you i've used the the contents of an ankle kit quite a bit more often than i've had to pull my firearm out of the holster that's what i say you know i i you know i i carry a gun too and you know, you're more likely to use a trauma kit and there's a good chance that, um, you know, you might even have to use it on yourself or a family member or a loved one. So, you know, it's not hard to learn trauma medicine. They let people like me do it. So <laughs> if, that, if I can do it, anybody can do it. The only thing you need to know is just some key details and how to use your gear and you'll be able to take care of someone in a really bad situation. All right. Uh, let, let's kind of make a delineation. Uh, stop the bleed. Very basic, easy. Uh, some of those classes, uh, uh, fire departments, police departments, a lot of different folks teach those, some as, as little as an hour. Kind of compare and contrast that against taking a more advanced class, something like you might teach, or I went to a, a two-day uh, TCCC class where it was much more involved, hands-on, and getting into a little more advanced stuff. But kind of compare those two, and where would you steer people uh, as far as their training? Yes, I'm a stop the bleed instructor, as a matter of fact, and um, I, it is a, a good for a good way of disseminating information to the masses very, very quickly. And it's the only the very key details of that information, you know, stopping the bleeding, you're not trying to do anything besides that, you're applying a tourniquet and direct pressure, and that's pretty much all you're doing. So um, it can get a little more complicated, of course, you know, there's, you can go to school for a long time, become a, you know, an, an ER nurse like your son and learn this stuff for the, for the real. But um, in order to take care of somebody and fix them, you don't have to know a whole lot. So Stop the Bleed is very, very short. It's just going to give you the very basic information that you're going to need. And uh, they do a good job of disseminating that and marketing it. So that's good. You know, the more people that get eyes on it, the better the marketing for that kind of thing, you know, the better it's going to be for everybody. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, I think a lot of your listeners in particular are going to be those types of people who 
uh, they're not after just the basics. They're trying to prepare themselves, you know, the warrior Wednesday, right. you know, kind of a thing. The, the most important part about being a warrior is being a well-rounded warrior. You know, a lot of times I see some people that will dedicate too much time and effort to learning, you know, a faster holster draw or, you know, better shooting and that kind of thing. And that's all important. Um, but that is a small aspect of being a warrior. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Physical fitness, you know, um, mental ability, um, training the gun, knife. And then, of course, medical is one of those things that everybody needs to know. If you're going to have the tools to poke holes in people, you should probably have the tools to patch those holes, especially if those holes get punched in you. So, yeah, definitely one of those things that's important for everybody to learn. Stop the bleed is a great start but you definitely want to keep going with it. There's a lot more to learn that you can use to help people out. And I think we kind of get uh, narrowly focused in this, uh, you know, even selling the trauma kits and things like that. It's really not just about a firearms or a knife related injury. I'll just give you a quick story here. I uh, moonlight as a pilot and I took a trip up to Northeast Iowa. And I just happened to walk into the uh, terminal building as one of the airport folks were opening mail with a pocket knife and they put it right in their hand. And suddenly, you know, there's a large amount of blood spurting out of the hand. Certainly they're not going to die from that. And the guy's like, oh, what am I going to do? And I just pulled out my ankle kit, <laughs> grabbed some combat gauze and wedged it in there and just said, here, hold this and get yourself for stitches. Uh, like I said, it could be a car accident. Uh, in Iowa, lots of farming, industrial manufacturing, uh, you're much more likely, I think, to use that than, uh, you know, going around waiting for a gunfight, which probably will never come. Exactly. Well, I mean, you, you turn something that could be potentially fatally catastrophic into something that's just a minor inconvenience. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a wound that could potentially kill that person. But then you patch them up, get them to the hospital, and then they're back with their family that night. You know, and, and that's it could be, you know, insanely beneficial for a lot of people. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the content of the kits that uh, are going out from Mountain Man. And I just kind of used uh, the experience I've seen from you and others on packaging what's uh, in the kits that uh, we're selling with Iowa Firearms Coalition. What do you consider the, the bare bones minimum that folks need to be uh, carrying with them on their body? And then maybe the next step, having a little more gear in the car. I would say, so bare bones is kind of hard, you know, because um, a lot of times you, you need gear. Um, gear right. helps a lot. Um, you can improvise your own trauma gear if you have to in a pinch. You know, that's something that I get trained to do in the military. Um, but that's not something that I recommend people using as their go-to. It takes time to, you know, to make that stuff. And we don't have a whole lot of time. That person sitting there bleeding out. If I'm trying to run around and find all the stuff that I need to make myself a good tourniquet, that person's just steadily bleeding away. So um, you need to have good gear on you if possible. But at the same time, you can't be carrying around a whole trauma bag with you. Right. everywhere you go um you can have this ankle kit is a fantastic way of carrying around your medical gear um on you and incognito just wearing it around ankle we get a lot of comments from people saying that they didn't think it was going to be as comfortable as it is um it's a very well made uh piece of kit uh the the uh the ankle strap itself and then of course i stock it with um all the things in it that I used when I was in the military and as an EMT for taking care of people. So this is all stuff that I've seen personally work um, and that has all been vetted by massive amounts of data. So um, having that stuff on you, throw on a quick tourniquet, that's extremely beneficial, especially if you're in a fight for your life. Maybe one of your family members takes a bullet and uh, they need to get that patched up. You can toss them a tourniquet and turn your attention back to the battlefield and make sure that you can handle those threats as they come while your family member applies that tourniquet. So, you know, using key things like that is uh, how you come out on top. So having that gear available to you is going to be pretty important. So I would say at minimum. I would like to see somebody carrying at least a tourniquet. Um, hopefully that they want to carry one of those ankle IFACs. If they do, then that's great. That's an entire trauma kit just on your ankle. Um, but if you don't, um, there's a great product out there called uh, the SWAT T. And that's usually what I'll carry. Um, if I am um, going to a concert, I can't carry a weapon or that kind of stuff, but I want to be a little extra prepared. This uh, SWAT T is a stretchy rubber band. And uh, you can use it for a lot of different things, um, but it comes packaged in this like tiny little square. 
mm-hmm. and you just slide that into a pocket and it's like carrying an entire trauma kit on you. Now it doesn't have like wound packing and, right. and, and uh, quick clot and that kind of stuff. But if this is all I've got, I can use this to take care of a lot of different wounds. So that's my, uh, my usual um, bare, bare minimum is going to be at least a tourniquet of some kind. And uh, the SWAT T tends to be the most comfortable for me. So, um, so in the, the ankle kits, we have the uh, soft T wide, which is one I really like because it packs a little bit flatter than the, the cat tourniquets. Yep. And uh, I have literally carried an ankle kit, I think uh, about six years now, every single day. And I can tell you, once you get used to this and it kind of molds to the shape of your ankle and you get it underneath your your uh, 511 pants or whatever you happen to wear, you literally do forget it. It's become so comfortable. Uh, uh, two years ago, we were doing uh, seven weeks of hiking and camping and I was like wading through streams and stuff. And then I thought, oh crap, <laughs> my ankle kit's on. And I had an orange uh, soft tea white at the time and the color bled out and I thought <laughs> I was bleeding and all this stuff, but uh, it literally gets so comfortable that you really do forget it's there until you need it, then you know it's there. That's correct. Now, I, if somebody would ask me, you know, like, hey, uh, do you think I could wear this, uh, you know, for a, a long hike, you know, a couple, couple days, couple weeks? No, nah, I'd be like, no, nah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> but that's crazy that that worked for you. That's good. That's good to know. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's every day. And like I said, if you get to a situation where you're biking or something, rip that off, put it around the, the frame of your bike or handlebars. There's just a lot of diff- different options to have that, that with you all the time. Yeah. Uh, Let's get into some training myths. I think it was four or five years ago, I went to one of the, the major firearm schools and took their trauma medicine course. And the, the guy that was teaching the class showed a, a cat tourniquet, like, like this one right here, we got on the, the bottom of the, the mountain man kit here. And he goes, you know, those are $30, but there's no sense spending $30. You're all wearing boots, right? And everybody's like, yeah. He goes, just take the laces out of your boots. And I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, you know, worst case scenario, you can, like you said, you can improvise something, but uh, number one, that takes time. And number two, uh, the old thing, boots, uh, shoelaces, things like that. Uh, why don't you tell us why that really is a bad idea? This was a medical instructor that was saying that? This was a medical instructor. And actually, I got so torqued off about the thing that uh, I, I went to their boss and said, you know, uh, compartment syndrome went into all the different medical things that that can cause using shoelaces. And they lost lost their job, but it was like, that was disinformation. And we hear things, you know, like homemade tourniquets all the time where if you have to do that, great. But uh, there's a big difference between trying to MacGyver something and having having it with you at the moment you need it. Right. And that, this kind of comes into that same t- type of capacity, you know, about having, you know, good quality proven gear on you. Um, the other one of the, the other side of one of those misses, you know, using a belt. I've heard people say like, oh, I'm not going to spend 30 bucks on a tourniquet. I'm, I'm wearing a belt. You know, um, but the problem with that is like, you know, I wear a lot of stuff, you know, I got a, a gun and a spare mag and a knife and, you know, flashlight. I, I need that to keep my pants up because that's where I've got all my gear. This is an essential piece of tool for me. This is not like an expendable accessory. So um, you need a belt on top of that. If you wedge it around your arm, you know, like you would like, you know, you're, you're tying off, then you, you're going to need to maintain the pressure on that end of that belt. Mm -hmm. Um, in order for you to get full occlusion. Hopefully you can get full occlusion of that artery, but there's a good chance that you won't, you won't get it tight enough. So, um, and even if you are able to get it tight enough, now you're weak from blood loss. There's a good chance that you're just going to pass out, let go of that tourniquet and just continue to bleed out. So having a good quality tourniquet on you and knowing how to improvise one on the fly is one of those, uh, those beneficial items. Um, coming back to talk a little bit about that whole, um, the problem with the boot laces is that the you can get full occlusion of the artery using something very, very small like that. But the problem is, is it puts so much pressure over such a small surface area, you're going to get tissue death and nerve damage much more quickly. The odds of that person losing that limb is going to increase dramatically um, unless they can get that tourniquet off quickly and get to a hospital. So you don't want to do that. That's why uh, the bands on a tourniquet are so wide. On a cat right. tourniquet, they're uh, 1.5 inches on the soft T. I think they're sitting at 1.83 inches. So they're a little bit wider. And so different tourniquets have different widths. Uh, this one, for example, is four inches 
mm-hmm. and width. So the wider a tourniquet, the more comfortable it's going to be for your casualty. Now, one of the problems that you'll see is people complaining more about the tourniquet being in place right. than they do about the injury that required it in the first place. Right. You know, so so they'll be saying, hey, can you just loosen this tourniquet a little bit? Or can you take this tourniquet off? It hurts so bad. And they will not let up on it because it's very uncomfortable. This is normal. If you've applied that tourniquet correctly, that tourniquet will be uncomfortable. And we need to make sure that we're talking our casualties into leaving that tourniquet in place. We need to tell them, no, this is what's keeping blood in your body. This is what's keeping you alive. We need to leave this tourniquet there. So the smaller that that band is, say, for example, your boot laces or you you just get some bailing twine or whatever the case is, and you wrap that around and make a tourniquet, um, there's a decent chance that one, it's going to hurt like crazy and they're not going to enjoy it at all. And two, it's much more of a risk of needing to get that limb amputated. Now I say that though, saying, you know, a lot of people are worried if I apply a tourniquet, that person's going to lose their leg. There's no way around it. This is just what's going to happen. And that's not the case. Um, That is the case if you leave that tourniquet on for way too long. Um, But the general rule of thumb is two hours. If you can get that person to the ER and get that tourniquet removed within two hours, there's little to no problems of that person um, needing to have that limb amputated. Um, I I, I stay up to date on the medical journals as often as possible, you know, in my job, you know, studying this stuff, uh, writing and talking about it. And the current thought process now is two hours, but they've had people coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan who have had tourniquets in place for up to six hours and have had that... um, that limb still saved. So I say that because I want people to put that tourniquet on first. I don't want them to hesitate. I don't want them to wait and see if the bleeding will just magically stop on the, on its own, which is something that people do sometimes. Um, yeah. We want to hop on that wound and get that bleeding taken care of as quickly as possible because you can bleed out in two minute, two and a half minutes, three minutes from a femoral artery bleed. So we want to hop on it, get that tied off as quick as possible. Yeah, and I, I can tell you lots of, uh, not firsthand, but secondhand observations from uh, the young men I've taught to be pilots that are flying the kind of stuff that you talked about. And six to eight hours uh, and still saving the limbs is not not unheard of with tourniquets. And I was just talking to some uh, FBI folks recently, and they're, they're not afraid to even let it go longer than that if they have to. So the number one thing, like I said, get the tourniquet on. Don't loosen it. Don't check it. Crank it down. Leave it. And... Uh, you know, keep keep going through your uh, algorithm to make sure that uh, you're not getting more bleeding or need a second tourniquet, things like that. All right, here, here's another big fallacy that we hear, and I, I literally hear this from well-intentioned people who served, uh, you know, Vietnam era and such, talking about using uh, feminine products for uh, bullet wounds. Tell me why that's a bad idea. Okay, yeah, well, this is a pretty popular one. This one, I think, is, is really funny because there's so many guys that are just think that this is just the best thing in the world. I think it's just because it just tickles them a little bit, you know, to use feminine products in combat, you know. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it, this one has had a really hard time dying because, I mean, it kind of makes sense a little bit, you know, you got a bullet hole. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got this gauze that's shaped kind of like a bullet hole and maybe we can just cram that in there and control the bleeding. Well, the problem with that is, um, is that that gauze is designed to soak up blood and not even that much blood. The amount of blood in menstruation is only a couple of tablespoons, I believe. It's right. not near, not very much at all. So, But the type of blood that we're talking about dealing with is catastrophic bleeding. This is horrendous torrents of blood that we need to be taken care of. And our job is not to soak up blood. The whole point of wound packing is to poke that gauze down tight on top of that artery to control the bleeding and then hold it in place with a pressure dressing. So you're not really accomplishing much by just packing down this tiny piece of gauze into that wound and hoping for the best. And if uh, I'll hear a lot of guys that'll talk about something along the lines of, well, I stock five tampons in my trauma kit at all times in case of bullet wounds. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to take the trouble to stock tampons, why don't you just stock actual wound packing gauze that's impregnated with a hemostatic agent that will control the bleeding with massive amounts of data behind it. Now, that doesn't mean I won't try it. You know, if I'm in a bad pinch and all I've got is a giant box of tampons, 
I'm going to try it, right? Why not? This person is going to die anyway, and maybe that this will work. Maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and give that a shot, but I'm definitely not going to prep my trauma bag with uh, improvised items when I have total access to the real thing beforehand. Yeah, my, my son, the trauma nurse, uh, did a little experiment on how many square inches are actually in a tampon compared to the massive amount of square inches that you have in uh, some Z-fold gauze or combat gauze or something like that. It's not even uh, in the same ballpark. Right. Yeah. It's it, it, totally, they're used for totally different things. One is made for trauma and the other one is not. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, chest seals. That's something they don't get into the stop the bleed, but if you move along and take some more advanced training, uh, the chest seals come into play. We pack a couple of those even in the, the ankle kits. So we're, we're not fixing anything. We're just kind of trying to delay the air from, uh, you know, getting into the, the plural space. So tell us why chest seals are effective, how folks should use them, and if it's something that you would even recommend folks carry. I absolutely recommend you carry them. They're really cheap and easy. Uh, they're very packable um, and um, very beneficial if you get in a bad situation. So you have penetrating trauma to your chest. You have a bullet that enters your chest cavity. Um, eventually, what will happen is as that person breathes in, they will suck a little bit of air into that hole and then it'll get trapped. The wound will act as kind of like a flapper valve. So when that person breathes out, that that positive pressure pushes against the wound, acts like a flapper valve, and keeps that wound closed and prevents the air from escaping. But every time that the person breathes in, it opens up and lets that more air in. Gradually, over time, that air can build and build and build to the point where it becomes what's called a tension pneumothorax. And that is, that is the dangerous thing that we're worried about. There's a really great movie out there called Three Kings. Um, they've got a scene in there where Mark Wahlberg is shot by an AK. And it's not a perfect scene because it shows the um, tension pneumothorax like develop immediately yeah. that's that's not exactly the case yeah. it, it takes a little bit of time but that's a great demonstration of what's happening inside of the human body um, to start causing problems so what happens the air in the chest starts to build and build and build until um, it starts putting pressure on the heart and eventually the heart can't beat fully anymore and it's not pumping blood around your body if you're not pumping blood around your body your brain's not getting oxygen and eventually you'll die so this is why it eventually it will become a bad thing so chest seals prevent that air from entering into the chest cavity in the first place and becoming a tension pneumothorax so it's not going to be beneficial if your casualty has already been shot in the chest and has been laying there for a long time um, it's putting one on is not going to remove the air from the chest. So we want to make sure that we get that on as soon as possible. As soon as you recognize that that person has a hole from neck to navel, we want to slap on a chest seal. Um, we're pretty safe to do that, right? All this chest seals are is a sticky piece of rubber. So if they didn't really need that, like say, you know, they get to the hospital and the doctor's like, ah, this isn't really a sucking chest wound. No big deal. They lose a little chest hair. Not, not a bad deal. A free so, waxing. A free waxing. That's all you give them, right? So that's not a big deal. So, you know, if you find a hole anywhere on their body, we want to make sure that we patch that um, because we don't know the trajectory of that round. We don't know what that round did once it entered the body. We don't know what's affected. So just slap a chest seal on it and then you don't have to worry about attention to thorax. Yeah. So on the other side of that, uh, you want to make sure that you're carrying at least two chest seals, right? So you have a entry wound and hopefully you'll have a, an exit wound or maybe not hopefully, but you know, you <laughs> might have an exit wound, right? So, um, but not always. Sometimes the bullets do weird things. They enter the body, kind of bounce around, they stay in, whatever the case is, but we need to make sure that we're checking for the entry and the exit wound and patching both um, because it's not doing us any good if we just patch the front and totally leave the back exposed. So that's another good thing why we have uh, shears in our trauma kits. Uh, what I find in my uh, amateur role here as a, just an enthusiast is folks are not doing a real thorough assessment of their patient. They're not getting rid of clothing. They're not moving shirts out of the way looking for, you know, like you said, both the entry and the exit. Or what we see uh, both in Iowa and when I spend the winter in Arizona is uh, these tension pneumothorax developing from uh, penetrating wounds from ATV accidents, from farming accidents, from uh, someone fell on a piece of rebar and they happened to pull it out or you know, lift themselves back up. 
same injury, just a, a different mechanism. Yes. Um, yeah. So you can get that from a, a bunch of different ways. So carrying that as many trauma kit or sorry, as many uh, chest seals on you as you can for, you know, if you're going to do like an active shooter bag that a lot of times I'll talk to people about that. Um, I'll go through often I'll get invited to some organization and say, Hey, can you come take a look at a trauma kit? Tell us what you think. Right. Um, tell us what we need. And a lot of times I'll open that up and it'll be, you know, either like just packed full of tourniquets or it'll have like a ton of things in there that they don't even need. Right. Um, for example, like band-aids or oral pharyngeal airways, you know, I'll lift up a bag of oral pharyngeal airways and I'll shake them at somebody. I'll be like, who knows how to use these? Right. Nobody knows how to use them. Right. right. So like, why do you have that? If you don't know how to use it. Right. So having a trauma kit with the gear in it that you know how to use is going to be very important. Um, and when it comes to preparing for something like an active shooter situation, a lot of times I'll talk to my churches and faith-based organizations um, and I'll have them, tourniquets are important. You need to have tourniquets in your trauma kit, mm -hmm. but I always like to have them put in much more chest seals than they normally would have. Um, in an active shooter situation, you tend to get these guys that walk around and taking carefully aimed shots. They're trying to, um, create a highest body count as possible. So they're going to be making upper chest and head shots. So you're much more likely to see chest wounds than you are limb wounds in an active shooter situation. So having enough chest seals to deal with that is going to be important. Um, I, it's been a little while since I've looked at the research, but I want to say that the average person has between three and four bullet holes per active shooter. Each uh, casualty has around three to four uh, bullet holes. So you need two chest seals for each bullet that hit that person. So you can see why if you're trying to take care of a lot of people, you might need a lot more chest seals. Yeah, and the other thing, just uh, with chest seals, you may screw one up. You may pull the adhesive off and start, and you fold it over on itself in the wind, or it gets caught on your glove. Now you have to dispose of that. So it's good to have multiples or the shears to cut one in half and make two out of one. Uh, so, so lots of options there. Let's right. let's get into the training world a little bit. If you can't get to a good in-person class, uh, you have created on the Mountain Man website for the folks that, that order stuff. You can get a link and go to, you have an extensive training video there. Take us uh, through that. How do folks find it? And uh, just a little bit about that. You know, hands-on is, is, is essential with the, the you know, developing the, the neural pathways of doing all this. But what can we gain from watching it, uh, like on your presentation? Yeah, well, we have the emergency trauma response course on Mountain Man Medical. Um, it is a uh, fairly comprehensive, it'll teach you everything that you need to know about basic trauma medicine. It's like, a, <coughs> excuse me, it's like a stop the bleed class on steroids. So um, it's only about an hour and 47 minutes long, I think, and you can do it at your own pace and that kind of thing. We've had quite a few thousand people that have gone through it and taken the course, um, had a lot of good you know, uh, feedback from doctors and nurses and um, medics and um, all sorts of people. So I think it's a really good class. And it's 100% free. You know, um, the whole reason I became a medic in the first place was just to help people. And so this is like me being a medic to like, thousands of people, Everyone you know? Uh, yeah. And so this is my opportunity to try to help people because I can't be there to take care of you. You got to know this stuff for you. Um, so this is where I wanted it to be free because this is our, it, all the gear that we sell, it won't do you any good if you don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So we offer it for 100% for free so that everybody can learn every, anybody can learn. Um, one of the things that we'll do is uh, a lot of people will, um, get the whole class and then um, watch it with their company, which is kind of cool. Um, so they'll buy a couple of our trauma kits and then train up their entire company on just the staff day. They'll have everybody just sit down and watch, uh, watch the videos. So, um, so it's a great course. It'll teach you bleeding control and wound packing and chest seals and all of that different type of stuff that you need to know um, to take care of somebody in a bad situation. So uh, that's a great option. They've got other things like stop the bleed and American Red Cross, of course, um, those are all good, but of course I'm biased. I'm going to say that mine's, you know, a little more comprehensive. I go into a little more detail and a little more demonstrations on, uh, uh, some, some different types of things. So that's definitely a good option. I think for a lot of people out there, if they want to, they want to go out and get that training, but don't want to see somebody in person. 
Yeah, so we don't need to be a doctor or even EMT to uh, you know work with your local employees and stuff like that. Order some trauma gear online. And what I tell folks to do is order a couple extra tourniquets. I usually get blue or some other color and make those the training ones mm -hmm. uh, and pass those around. Let folks use them over and over. And then just like your your carry gear for your firearm, I'm going to keep my good hollow points on me all the time and then yep. use training rounds for something else. Same thing in the medical world. So get some extra gear. You can get trainer chest seals. You can get all that and practice with it and then keep your own trauma kit ready for when you need it most. Excellent. So, yeah, Brian, I appreciate you spending time with us today. I'll put a link here uh, below so folks can uh, directly access both the, the IFC kits that we sell uh, through Mountain Man and your, your your trauma training course. So we appreciate that. Appreciate uh, your involvement and in, uh, not just training people to stay safe, but how to save lives uh, on their worst day. Excellent. Well, thanks for having me on. I had a blast. It was excellent talking to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll see you down the road. All right, John. You bet. Bye-bye.